So our next speaker um, comes from a, probably a particularly male-dominated industry. Um, <laughs> Lara is the, uh, she runs Greek sea bass and bream producer, Kefalonia Fisheries. Um, she's a real mover and sh shaker in the aquaculture sector, I think it's fair to say. You've probably, a lot of you have seen her speak before. Um, she's a member of the board of the Federation of Greek Mariculture and the Hellenic Aquaculture Producers Organization. Um, she works with the FAO um, and Yes, and she runs, and on the side, she runs a, <laughs> runs a bass and bream farm. So there we go. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about driving cultural change in the sea. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. It's really, really, really a pleasure to be here today. Um, so culture, yes. I am from uh, the Mediterranean. I'm actually originally from the Middle East. Uh, I'm Saudi Arabian. I live and work in Greece in the seafood business. So I have a trifecta, really. Uh, I used to be a trader on Wall Street. Uh, many, many years ago. So I have a lot of experience with what it's like to be the only woman in the room. And um, at first, when I talked to Elizabeth about what I should speak about, I said, oh, you know, culture here, I, you know, I know I've experienced it a lot. And so cultural bias, really, is at the core of what, of our challenges, really, in the seafood industry, and the workplace in general is women. Um, see how, to, how do I change this? There we go. And just as some societies are more traditional than others, um, industries can be also more or less traditional. Given that the seafood industry is at its core, its historical core, a tough, dangerous job, it's understandable that it's male-dominated, even though women have also always played an important role, even if it's only in supporting a supporting role back on land. Today, though, fisheries and aquaculture um, are multi-billion euro industry. The, its importance as a source of nutritious, sustainable protein will only increase going forward. It's made up of large, publicly traded companies, just as Anne just mentioned, um, who court investors and customers the world over. Yet in many ways, its culture is still tied to its traditional past. Cultural biases are alive and well, and although subtle, still present formidable challenges. Changing cultural biases is important, because otherwise, no matter how many legal protections are in place, we will not progress to a more gender ne neutral society. Take my country, Greece. We are members of the EU and have progressive laws providing for equal opportunity and protection for women in the workplace. These laws prohibit discrimination, direct or indirect in hiring, harassment, sexual or otherwise, and discrimination because of pregnancy or motherhood. In practice, however, these laws are rarely enforced and women very rarely appeal to the court for redress. In fact, Greece has ranks absolutely last in the, gender, in the European Gender Equality Index. All the way there, the bottom, okay? And the reasons are exactly as you would imagine. In discrimination cases, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff. In sexual harassment cases, the woman is rarely believed. The cost of being seen as a troublemaker is onerous for a woman's career. It's difficult to be hired again if you're a troublemaker. The message from society is that boys will be boys, or that the woman asked for it. And women also either don't know that these laws exist or don't believe that they will get their rights enforced. So we have the window dressing, but the strong cultural biases almost make it irrelevant. I have a colleague who claims not to be technologically minded and makes his secretary read and print out the dirty jokes his friends send him. He thinks this is very funny. Yes, it's juvenile, but it's obvious also that this kind of behavior encourages a workplace environment where women feel humiliated, unfairly treated, and even sometimes unsafe. There's also a multitude of much more subtle cultural biases. I find that men expect to compete with each other, but are often unpleasantly surprised when a woman exhibits the same drive and toughness. A competitive man is natural. A competitive woman is a bitch. I first came this, across this when a competitor called me philodoxy in Greek. My understanding, I'm not originally Greek from, from the Middle East, was that it meant ambitious, 
and I took it as a compliment. I later understood that it actually really means being pushy, a climber. I was very often chided for not being at home with my children. And on the other hand, I was also very often chided for not staying late at board meetings or conferences because I wanted to be home with my children. But although I'm describing a culture that's a little bit stereotypical, a bit folkloric, sure, Mediterranean, Middle East, etc., these biases, these subtle biases, also exist in our industry, even in more progressive societies. The McKinsey and Lean In Org 2017 report, Women in the Workplace, found that gender bias and underrepresentation in the workplace continues because we have very different perceptions of the situation and understanding of the problem. For example, men overwhelmingly believe that women are well represented in executive leadership, even in companies where only 10% of those leaders are women. So how could women succeed in such an environment? Well, I think all of us here have developed um, approaches. Be good at what you do. Learn skills, develop expertise. Work hard and then work harder. Be patient and develop a sense of humor. Use your EQ. We're good at this. Find mentors, role models, and allies. The fact that you're in this room means that you already know all of this. But what I'd really like to bring to the discussion is how can we change these attitudes collectively and on the whole, and not just learn to succeed despite them? Our industry, some years ago, committed to sustainability. Look at any company's website, promotional materials, mission statement, or annual report, and you'll find the word sustainability used again and again. Some of this surely is greenwashing, but most of it is real. And the message that we have to change as an industry has really sunk in, both in fisheries as well as aquaculture. Could we not advocate for the same commitment to change for women in seafood? I'm very proud to work in an industry which I feel is at the forefront of the blue revolution. I would be even prouder if it was also at the forefront of gender equity. A modern dynamic industry which would be attractive to young people entering the workforce. The case to be made here is even more profound than just pleasing the women. It's about attracting young talented people, the best and the brightest, men or women. We know that millennials choose a career or employers not just because of salary or prospects, but increasingly on how they perceive their workplace's values. The issue is not how many women are present in ex executive positions, but how diverse a company's decision makers are. More diverse companies are better able to win top talent, improve their customer orientation, employee satisfaction, and decision making all of which leads to better performance. We know this, we've seen this in many, many, many studies. In a survey of 366 publicly traded companies in the US, the UK, and Canada, McKinsey found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. I think this tells us something. And it's not because women are any better at management than men. It's just that diversity of opinion and approach yields better results, and this makes sense. In my opinion, it's a question of survival. Do we want an aging, anachronistic industry or a dynamic, innovative, inclusive one, which is also vibrant? Changing cultural bias and stereotypes takes time. Generational change and education. This is the obvious answer to the question, how do you drive cultural change in the seafood industry? But that's not good enough. We know that there are concrete actions that can be taken which can make a difference. I recently asked a colleague of mine in Greece why there were so few women on boards, despite the number of successful women entrepreneurs and company owners. His answer was that there were very few women with board expertise, and that they were reluctant to have board members without board experience. He completely missed the irony or the paradox, let's say, of his answer. He was very well-intentioned, by the way. The Economist recently published an article, just last week, I think, very reluctantly admitting that Norway's uh, board quota 
that 40% of um, board members of listed companies must be women, has in fact led to a dramatic change in gender balances on boards and has served as an inspiration for more than a dozen other countries. The article's main criticism, though, was that although female director, directors had dramatically increased, it hadn't helped women further down in any organization. Um, 80 to, no, I think 80 to 90 percent of women in management jobs in Europe are still men. But that's neither surprising to me, nor a reason to simply shrug the issue off and conclude that we have to be patient. Change takes time. For us to see more comprehensive change, we have to increase the number of women entering our industry. For the number of entrants to increase, the industry must be seen as attractive. And once a woman is in, obviously, then fair tra treatment and respectful work environment is essential to keep her in. And the last element, of course, and it's been mentioned before, and I'm sure it'll be mentioned again tonight, is to work with families. And note that I don't mean women, I mean families, men and women. This means childcare and flexible work opportunities. So of course, it's not as simple as a quota system as, as Norway's is, but neither is the quest for sustainability. Nobody ever imagined that there would be an instantaneous magic way to be sustainable overnight. We all recognize that it's a complex moving target that we must work for every single day. And in the same way, I don't want to be passive about increasing diversity in our industry, nor am I particularly interested in telling war stories or complaining. What I think we need to do today is develop consensus on how we can take the first step, set a concrete goal, a timeline, and get it done. I would like to challenge you all to think about what initiatives we could take today, I mean really today, which could be measurable and significant. I want to point out that I think as of last year, women make up 60% of college graduates worldwide. So we're not talking about a minority. We're talking about a very unique opportunity for this industry to really be modern and really attract a pool of individuals, men or women, that can make us even more dynamic and more innovative. Thank you.